Okay, uh, I guess we've got a little bit of time. So um, I called this talk How to Build a De-Identified Clinical Warehouse. And uh, I guess you could say it's How to Build a De-Identified Clinical Warehouse and Beyond, uh, because it moves beyond single institutions. Um, so here's a pop quiz. And so some of you have met with me today, so you might already know where I'm going with this. Um, so if, if I took a, a poll of the audience, you know, what would you say this corresponds to? And, and obvious answers are perfectly permitted. The it's the letter A, right. That's what most people will say. Okay, so let's say that, and this doesn't move anywhere, great. So let's say that's a little piece of DNA, right? So let's say that's, uh, that's one portion of a SNP. All right, so there's probably about seven billion people in the world that have the SNP or a SNP with the letter A in it. Okay, so we can take that out to a single nucleotide polymorphism and, and look at the diploid aspect of the genome. You know, we got one for our mom, we got one for our dad. There's probably about three and a half billion people in the world that probably have this type of a combination in their genome. All right, and take two SNPs, there's probably about, maybe about uh, one billion that have this. So basically what I've just shown you is the uniqueness of DNA, right? This is going to become more and more identifying the more pieces of DNA that you have about an individual. And so when we say this, and then we say the word de-identified in the same phrase as DNA, People go, that's an oxymoron. You, you really can't put those two in the same sentence. And, and I say, well, no, let, let's take a step back. Let's, let's think about this. Because de-identified is really just a technical term. It's a very specific term. And you can't really know what federal regulation says about this and tells you how you're supposed to manage such information if you have a very dichotomous view of what's identifiable and what's not. Um, so a lot of this goes back these issues of de-identification that I'm about to throw in your face, a lot of this goes back almost 15, 20 years uh, to an incident known as the, what I call the quasi-identifier conundrum. So the conundrum went as follows. Uh, so, so back in the, the 1990s, huh, 90s, uh, so how many people were around at that time? All right. Uh, so, so you may recall that at that time, uh, Hillary Clinton was trying to renovate healthcare um, much in the way that healthcare was trying to be renovated today. And at the time, um, you know, the, this notion of providing data out of the clinical enterprise for policy evaluation or clinical outcomes assessment was not very common. And so she went around to different state agencies and she said, you know, what type of information would you need to really make informed decisions? And they said, so, so these are the types of things that we, we'd like to have. We'd like to know about diagnostics. We'd like to know about procedures. We'd like to have some demographics on the patients that that are, that, are, uh, that are being treated, um, and we'd like to know how much this stuff costs at a particular institution. And so um, at the time, uh, or at that time, around um, 45 or 50 states started collecting this type of information and making it available as hospital discharge data. Um, and so that was, a, everybody thought that was a great idea. And then at the same time, um, oh no, oh, maybe that keyboard doesn't work, okay. So then at the same time, there was a very high profile re-identification of an individual who was in this type of information. Now this guy, you probably don't know who this is, this is the governor of the state of Massachusetts at the time. This was William Weld. And William Weld was basically giving a speech before a crowd. And he passed out, he basically fainted while he was on stage. And nobody knew what happened to him. He was admitted to Massachusetts General Hospital. And then he went home and nobody knew what was going on. Uh, and then this enterprising young uh, MIT graduate student said, I can tell you what happened to this guy. And she did. Now, full disclaimer, that was, that was my doctoral dissertation advisor, so I, I always put her up on high. Um, so Latanya Sweeney basically found out what was wrong with him. And the way she had done it was she ended up cross-referencing this hospital discharge data with publicly available information in the form, in the form of a voter registration list. Um, and she specifically went for the voter registration list in the city of Cambridge. Um, this stuff was free, and that cost her $20. Um, she crossed the two pieces of information on the demographics that you see here. Basically, it was five-digit zip code, the birth date, the gender. This was pre-HIPAA. Um, and so out popped William Weld. And, and, and a lot of people freaked out, and they actually didn't know what had happened. She said, I identify this guy. And so there were stories that came out, like the Boston Globe published a story that said, 
you know, um, um, computer scientist hacks the, the, the code or breaks into a secure system. And, and really all she did was take two files, drop them into Microsoft Excel, sort them, and then just join them. And that was it. And that was how the re-identification was done. It was extremely simple. Um, so, so she went on to do this study that showed that you, know, you take five digits dip, you take the birth date, you take the gender of an individual, and, and you look at the population demographics in the United States, and about somewhere between 60 to 90% of the people in the US are gonna be unique on those combination of features. Um, so that was, that was a, a concern. So this <coughs> study um, set the world on fire. It, it, it really did. Everybody uh, refers to that study. It's got thousands of citations if you look at Google Scholar. Um, and, and it was not just in healthcare. So I wanted to give you a little bit of, a, of an idea of why de-identification is a big, much broader problem than what happens in healthcare and where these uh, publications come from. Um, so, so 2006, AOL, they were still in business. They were still around. Uh, AOL wanted to be a good Samaritan to the information retrieval community. And so AOL had a research branch, and the research branch said they were going to supply uh, query data on uh, about 650,000 of their American constituents. And what they did was they provide the time at which a query was made, the date uh, at, at, on which the query was made, and they have also say what they queried for as well as what they ended up clicking after that query went through. To provide this data, they did what they would call de-identifying it. They took the names of the individuals. Oh, sorry, so it's 20 million queries over a three month period. And what they did was they took the names of these people and they just replaced them with persistent pseudonyms, okay? So you can see that this guy uh, searched for books and then at a couple days later, he searched for porn. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of insight into user 44177749. This person issued hundreds of queries. Things like for numb fingers, 60 single men, last name equal to Arnold, um, they have a dog that urinates on everything. Uh, okay, starting to see some location specific places. Georgia, something about some, some personal effects like dry mouth, nicotine effects. Um, okay, so you see what popped up at the top there? Where it said uh, Barbara Owen Zeller, New York Times. So two enterprising investigative journalists for the New York Times found that, that AOL was putting this stuff online and they said, hey, uh, I wonder if we can figure out who this information corresponds to. Um, so they ended up finding out that that data corresponded to Thelma Arnold and her dog Dudley. That's the dog that urinated on everything. They said, is this your information? And she said, well, yeah, how'd you, how'd you find that out? And they said, well, well, did you know that America Online is posting this information online? And she said, no. And they said, well, would you mind if we wrote a story about this? And she said, uh, no, I would prefer that you did. So they wrote the story. And let me give you a little bit of a timeline, what happened here. And this is a cautionary tale for the healthcare community. So in July of 2006, the information was posted online. In early August 2006, the New York Times article was published. In mid-August 2006, AOL removed the data set. And then in late August, the CTO resigned. The researcher and the project manager that allowed that data to go online were both dismissed from the institution, or from the, uh, the company. And then in 2006, the class action lawsuit was filed, which was settled two years ago for multi, multi-million dollars. Um, and you thought that we might have learned, and then Netflix, how many people use Netflix? A decent number of you? So did anybody hear the Netflix challenge? So a couple of yours. So, so what happened with Netflix was Netflix uh, basically put out 450,000 individuals movie reviews. And they said, if you can figure out how to create a data mining model that will predict what people will watch as their next movie at 10% better than what we normally do, then we'll give you a million dollars. And so this became a huge competition. Um, and a couple of enterprising academicians, friends of mine at the University of Texas, ended up showing that you could take the Netflix data and you could cross-reference it with data on IMDb and you could end up re-identifying people. They're just the movies that people watched. At the same time, this ended up turning into a class action lawsuit against Netflix. And Netflix ended up settling. They were going to run a second competition where they were going to hold a competition for about, I think, $3 million. And they pulled the plug on that right away. Okay, so doesn't take much to actually distinguish you. That's really what I'm talking about here. So there's been a bunch of studies on demographics. 
There's been studies on search queries, movie reviews, as we just saw. We've done some work on diagnosis codes, laboratory tests, DNA, not that much to distinguish you as you would imagine, um, health survey responses, and then all this other stuff. Um, I mean, you can imagine how these little pieces of information is build up and it's a very high dimensional environment so it just becomes a signature very quickly. Okay, so this leads me to a very influential law article that was published about a year and a half ago, I guess no, it's two years ago now, by um, Paul Ohm, who's now an advisor to the Federal Trade Commission. Um, Paul published this paper called Responding to the Surprising Failure of Anonymization, and he basically just brought up all the things I was telling you about. He said a couple things in this article. So he basically said, one, um, it's become really easy to re-identify people in current technology. He said, two, he's like, we basically have a fundamental misunderstanding about all ideas of privacy. He said, three, this is not just a, a fundamental misunderstanding about the ideas. This actually pervades all law, regulation, and all debate that we've been having. And we shouldn't have this debate anymore because privacy does not exist in the way that we expected to. Um, so then, at around the same time, the same guys who did the re-identification of Netflix basically came out with a paper called The Myths and Fallacies of Personally Identifiable Information. And then Mark Rothstein, very influential bioethicist, came out in the American Journal of Bioethics and said, is that de-identification really sufficient for protecting health privacy? That started raising a bunch of eyebrows. Um, so, fast forward to 2011. We're almost up to the current time. And what happened was HHS put out an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. And this was for human subjects. And they basically said, look, regardless of what information is removed from a data set, it is possible to extract DNA from a biospecimen. So we're talking about biorepositories here. And you could potentially link it to otherwise available data to identify individuals. This was in no uncertain terms. And this was their justification for basically saying that they are considering relabeling all biospecimens and any secondary analysis of data derived from biospecimens as identifiable all the time, which completely changes the way that regulations would currently work. Now, this is just an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. They haven't moved forward on this yet, but they've received approximately a thousand comments so far, most of them pretty negative. It's, it's a pretty wide AMPRM that covers everything from um, multi-site uh, consent to, to identifiability, um, but we'll see where it goes. Okay, so this comes back to de-identification. Basically what I've done is I've given you a bunch of examples of how people have poked holes in the system. All right, so I didn't really give you any type of a definition of what de-identification is. But before I do that, I wanted to make a comment about certain movements within the executive branch. Um, so has anybody seen this article come out? This was a, a, a monograph that was published by uh, the Office of the President. It's called Privacy and Progress and Whole Genome Sequencing. Um, so this is the Bioethics Commission of, uh, of the, the White House, um, which I believe is actually chaired by UPenn's president, uh, Amy Gutman. So um, you can see down in this corner, recommendation 2.2. What they said was accessible whole genome sequence data should be stripped of traditional identifiers whenever possible to inhibit recognition of re-identification. This is interesting because it starts to fly in the face of all the evidence that we've seen, which basically says that data is identifying. The ANPRM is going to say that DNA is always identifying or potentially identifying. And the Bioethics Commission is saying, whoa, 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 no, 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 look, remove the names. Don't just put the names out there. So. One last aspect of policy. One of the reasons why people are really concerned about de-identification or identifiability is that they take money from the federal government for doing research. Um, the NIH's data sharing policy, uh, which was issued back in 2003, said, look, if we give you half a million dollars for any year of your study, then you are going to figure out how to share the data. Uh, or you would have to come up with a data sharing plan, or you would have to say, tell us why it's not possible. Um, which is basically extortion, because they say that you have to tell us this before we review your grant proposal, which is fun. Um, they also said, look, when you share that data, it must be devoid of identifiable information. 
under the NIH data sharing policy. It wasn't an option. They didn't say you, you get to share identified data for us. Um, it has to be devoid of identifiable information. But they wouldn't define what identifiable information is. They punted. They said, go look at HIPAA. HIPAA gives you a definition, go use it. All right, so that takes us to the elephant in the room, which is HIPAA, right? So we all know that it's the US Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. All right, so HIPAA has its own problems. That's fine. It, it basically only covers covered entities. We know this, that's a problem, but it regulates the use of PHI. And PHI in HIPAA is defined as information that's either explicitly linked to a particular individual or could reasonably be allowed to identify individual identification. All right, so they actually gave in HIPAA a bunch of different ways in which health information can be shared. De-identified is only one part. Um, the first one, and, and I'm sure a lot of people use this um, because I've actually used it, is you can use identified patient data um, and you can do it under a waiver of consent provided that the data is on the shelf the risk associated with the use of that information or the information that will come out of it is considered to be minimal to the, uh, uh, the patient. Uh, and that you, you'd have to show that consent is impracticable to obtain. Um, this is pretty important for modern informatics research because as you start moving towards research with data sets on the orders of millions to multi-millions of individuals, it's gonna be extremely difficult to go back and get consent from them. But a lot of people are very hesitant to do that with a lot of people. So the, the second option that HIPAA gave was use a limited data set, which basically said you remove 16 designated attributes, and then you give the data to somebody who signs their life away in blood, saying that they're not going to attempt to re-identify someone, and they're only gonna use the data for what they told you they were gonna use it for. If somebody's not willing to sign that agreement, and they don't need certain attributes that I'll get to in a second, then you can have de-identified data. And under de-identified data, they gave two different options, one of which is called safe harbor and one of which is called expert determination. So to understand what de-identified data is, you really have to look now at the fields. All right, so a limited data set where this is like the type of 16 attributes that you'd have to remove. Um, I, I didn't list all of them, I'm just giving you the types. So, so names, it's a duh, right? You know, don't give out the names of the patients. Um, any unique numbers, like their medical record number, their social security number, don't give out internet related information, like their IP address or their email address. Don't give out biometric data, like a fingerprint or a voice print. Funny enough, and, and this has been true for years, DNA is still not designated as an identifier under HIPAA, which it's a little, that's a little dicey, but we'll come back to that. Okay, so here we get to the identified data. Here's your first definition in the federal regulations. Take a limited data set and extend it by three steps. One, don't give out dates. Anything that's less specific than a year, you can't have it. Don't give out the age of the individual if it's over 90 or anything can apply that. Um, geocodes, uh, you basically can have it at the level of the first three digits of the zip code, provided that that area covers at least 20,000 people. There's only about eight of the three digit zip codes in the country that don't satisfy that criteria. Um, how they came up with 20,000, great question. Who asked that one? I saw a couple of you start to ask it. There is no answer. Um, the catch-all, the catch-all is really funny. They say any other unique identifying number characteristic or code. This was not meant to be anything. This was, hey, we didn't list a barcode in here. Don't give out barcodes. We didn't list clinical trial numbers. Don't use clinical trial numbers. Um, but then on Safe Harbor is this one itty bitty little comment down at the bottom. Uh, it says, you must have no actual knowledge that the remaining data can be used to identify the patient or the research subject. This is interesting, and this is actually something that a lot of people don't pay attention to when they're reading the reg. This basically says that if you, even if you remove those 18 things and you look at this and you go, hey, that's Joe that is not gonna be de-identified data because you know how that information is going to be re-identified, provided you know that somebody can do it and it's not just you. Okay, um, I will also mention, I've said this to a couple people today, actual knowledge, it turns out, is a legal term and I didn't know that um, until I talked with OCR, uh, with the Office for Civil Rights over the last couple of years. They said actual knowledge means clear and explicit documentation 
that you can know who this individual is or, or how to do something. If you don't have any clear and explicit documentation, then there's no evidence for actual knowledge. Okay, so let me show you how we built a clinical de-identified repository at Vanderbilt. Now that I've given you an idea of what we're talking about here. So we've got a lot of data. I mean, like we've got data on about two million patients at, at Vanderbilt. Uh, we've got about probably, um, it's terabytes of data easily. We're starting to border on petabytes. And it covers everything from clinical notes to CPOE related data to messages exchanged between docs to lab tests uh, that, that we've collected. It comes from about Mm, 110 different clinical information systems that we all have feeding into uh, one warehouse. And it's all designated, it's all controlled, uh, linked through a patient identifier, like the medical record number, for instance. Um, so I call this, uh, sorry, this should have said the research derivative, right? So the research derivative is a, is a program that was started by Paul Harris, who a lot of you know because he started REDCap. So research derivative is available to all investigators at Vanderbilt, provided they've got appropriate IRB approval to come in and do a study. So Dan Macy's had this brilliant idea back at the, the dawn of the 2000s and said, could we create a de-identified version of this and use it for research purposes and make it really easy to get access to the data? And that was what Dan asked me to start. And so I said, okay, so let's try to figure out how to de-identify all that text and all the clinical information and what we're going to do is we're going to control access or, or restrict access through a one-way hash. So instead of just saying we're going to link through the name, we're basically just going to create a hashed version of that. Now, we'll come back to the scrubbing of how this works in a moment. At the same time, Vanderbilt started building BioView. Um, so this is our biorepository. Our biorepository is only the identified and it's tied to the clinical information through that one-way hash of the patient identifier, which in this case is the medical record number. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking leftover blood from the clinical setting, um, and we do, first of all I should mention, we use an opt-out model. So in an outpatient environment, we basically are asking people if they will opt out of being a member of the biorepository. Uh, and if they fail to opt out, then if they go to have their blood drawn for any type of a test, we take the leftover blood, we basically put a uh, de-identified hash on the uh, tube itself, and then we store the DNA lysate in a freezer, and then we allow people to use it for research purposes tied to the clinical information. All right, so I gotta be really clear here. Um, we did not start to do this without a lot of oversight. Um, it started way back in 2004. So this is not the informatics component of the talk. This is due diligence with respect to ethical principles and just doing right by your community. So in 2004, we started focus groups with the community. And by community, I mean people that come to Vanderbilt. We didn't use all individuals. We used people who might be representative of different strata, different demographics, different types of uh, uh, religious beliefs and, and employment. Um, so we start these focus groups, we start doing some surveys, we start disseminating some materials, and then we establish a community advisory board. And we still have a community advisory board that we report to three times per year so that they know what's going on with the biorepository and that they can make recommendations on what it can and cannot be used for. So for instance, if they say we don't want you to do psychiatric research, we won't do psychiatric research. But that hasn't happened yet. The funny thing was that in 2005 they said, well, you're only starting this with the adult population. It would be really great if you did this with the children's population. And we said, give us a couple of years. Let's see if this works. Um, so in addition to this, we started taking out um, uh, news articles. We started taking out advertisements in various newspapers, and we ended up on the front page of the Tennessean just so that we could get the message out there. Um, so the community was an extremely strong part of this. Um, we then did a lot of feasibility and, and uh, methods testing just to make sure that the de-identification technologies that we were going to put in place actually work. Um, we did a pilot test. This is really funny. So um, in 2007, we told everybody that we were going to start collecting biospecimens and creating our de-identified biorepository, and we didn't. We just wanted to see what people would do. And we set up a phone number. We said, look, if you have a problem with this, call the phone number. 
that phone number went directly to Dan Macy's. Because so, he was the one who felt the most comfortable dealing with people who might be a little irate that we were doing this. Um, we didn't have a lot of people that called the phone number. Um, for the most part, everybody was comfortable about this. Uh, and, and people were reading the consent forms. I should mention that the consent was at the bottom of the waiver to treat in the outpatient setting. And basically had a big checkbox that said, do not use my blood for any type of research purposes or de-identified research purposes. Okay, so we do our methods and feasibility assessments. Um, we got the IRB involved because the IRB was associated with the establishment of this repository. Um, we continued with our ethics review and modification. So I, I actually also sit on the um, ethics advisory board, but that also consists of people like Mark, Roth, Mark Rothstein and Bartha Knoppers. Um, and then we went live in the middle of 2007. Okay, uh, so de-identification with respect to regs. So we're basically doing this under non-human subjects research. Um, IRB has given approving for, approval for that. Uh, they said you can do this provided you continue to have uh, external ethics oversight. Um, so, right, as we moved forward, one of the things that we did was we put in a little speed bump. Speed bump was we're not going to give the same hash to every investigator because we don't want them coordinating, saying, hey, I've got record X, do you have record X? We wanted everything to come back through us as the broker of the data so that they didn't try and circumvent the system. And so we took the hash, and for every time we gave an individual, an investigator, access to this resource, we generated an investigator-specific ID. We originally created it so every study that you were conducting would have its own ID. But the investigator said, this is, this is ludicrous. We're annotating documents. We're trying to keep documentation on what we're doing. But every time we get the same record, like if I'm doing a type 1 diabetes study and a type 2 bi bi diabetes study, and it's on the same population, let's say, or part of that population, I don't want to redo all that work. And I need to know who these people are, or I need to be able to track that record. So we took it a step back. And instead of doing study, we did investigator-specific IDs. Um, so we basically created a, a two-tier access model. Um, we set up the first one to allow people to do initial hypothesis generation. We basically created an interface to the de-identified data. And so, for instance, an individual can construct a series of predicates, like, well, I want to see somebody who has juvenile diabetes, they're on an antipsychotic medication, and there was an adverse event with their meds within a three-month period. And then we give them aggregate results to see if there was even sufficient data for them to continue their study. Um, we basically, we built the whole system uh, ourselves. Um, again, I credit Paul Harris's group for, for creating this. Um, we uh, created a system that gave people the ability to search for specific ICD-9s. We did full indexing on all of the uh, free text and all the EMR. Uh, we indexed all labs, all vitals, and, and you can see where this is going. And so this was the way we allowed people to create those queries. We didn't want them to write SQL. You, you really don't want your investigators writing SQL. Because usually what happens is they call you and they say, I need help writing SQL. And then we go get Josh Denny and he gets tired dealing with everybody. So, um, right, we allow people to do drag and drop, basically. And then they get to execute their query. And it says, hey, you got, in this case, I was looking for, uh, what was this? This is our type 2 diabetes, right? And so we've got, let's say, in this special case, 152 people, 107 females, 45 males. And here's some instances of uh, uh, how many counts break down by different uh, uh, ethnicities and ages. Actually, hmm, I'm not showing you the right thing. Anytime something's below a count of five, we actually set this up so that it was a random number between one and five. Um, so this must have been under an IRB approved study. Okay. So we did that for privacy related issues that we didn't want to give out small cell counts. Okay. So um, that's for the entire EMR system. If you then want to do a drill down and say, well, who's got DNA in the system? You basically just check the radio box and then you reissue your query. You see there's going to be less people involved. Um, we usually have a rule of thumb with when you're trying to do phenotyping, basically take whatever you count you see here and then divide it by four because that's usually how many people are probably going to be useful for your research study at that point. That's a whole long story about phenotyping that we can get into afterwards. 
Okay, so that's the type of system we set up for the investigators at level one. So after you do your hypothesis generation, if you want to move forward with your study, you then come to us with an approved IRB protocol. Now, you're working with the identified data, but at the same time, you're still working sometimes with natural language text. You're going to be working on with a biorepository. In our institution, and I learned this is not true at CHOP, our IRB wanted to be involved. They wanted to give the waiver. They wanted to have documentation that you're doing this study. So the IRB protocol has to be approved. The data use agreement then needs to be established with the managers of the biorepository and the, the clinical warehouse. Uh, and you submit all that with your query again back to the broker. And at this point, we're going to give you all of the scrubbed information, all right, as well as those investigator-specific IDs mapped to each record that I talked about. And we'll also give you the biospecimens at that point. Um, if the DNA has already been sequenced, you can go off and just request the data as opposed to actual biospecimens. All right, so redaction in natural language. This is what people ask me a lot about today. Um, so here's an example of something that you might see in the medical record system. We've got, we've got Smith, 61-year-old, got a daughter, Lynn, saw a particular oncologist on a date. All right, so the way that you go about redacting identifiers in natural language is you're basically at natural language processing. Um, and, and the most simple way of doing natural language processing is you write a bunch of rules, declarative rules. You come up with some dictionaries. What are the names of your patients? What are the names of the healthcare providers? Um, we chose to redact the names of the healthcare providers, which, which is not required, but it was, it was deemed um, important for the clinicians to have buy-in into the de-identification of the EMR system. Uh, and so you could have a bunch of regex, you can have some lexicons, you can have some very note-specific rules. We found that uh, certain types of notes that were coming out of cardiology, they were using very esoteric terms that we didn't know what they were, so we had to write some specific rules for them. Um, Vanderbilt in particular went off and purchased a de-identification uh, piece of software um, from a company called, oddly enough, DID, which was a spin-off from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, DID is basically a black box piece of software. They tailor it specifically to your institution and they get you to pay a lot of money to do so. Um, but it ends up being a pretty, pretty good piece of software. You can see that the, the recall on it ends up being around 0.999 in terms of finding the identifiers in the natural language. Now, it wasn't just DID. We ended up having to write some of our own pre-processing and post-processing software to wrap around it because DID was a little buggy with the way our data was formatted and, and it was just easier for us to write it than to go back to DID and ask for their assistance. Um, so basically what we're doing is we've got a data bank that's restricted to Vanderbilt employees at this point. It's not a public resource. Um, you're signing your data use agreements that are prohibiting re-identification. And all of these studies are subject to review by an operations advisory board and the institutional review board. We actually have, we have an operations advisory board, we have an ethics advisory board, and a community advisory board associated with this repository. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got our project-specific IDs, everybody's got a specific password, and anything that you do in terms of your queries are being logged and audited. So, if you're coming in, you're doing a study for diabetes, if you end up coming in and issuing lots of queries for people with cystic fibrosis, that may end up triggering a flag. Okay, um, so I gave you a little bit of a perspective on how natural language processing works. You know, write a bunch of rules, use a dictionary. Um, but I'm not a big fan of rules uh, because it doesn't scale. And so recently, well recently, for the last five years, uh, we've been working on machine learning versions for doing natural language processing and removing identifiers from text in a much more flexible and reusable way. Now, there's a bunch of different algorithms and strategies that you could use. I'm, I'm listing a couple of them here. These have all been published as strategies for finding identifiers in natural language. The one that we've been working with the most are conditional random fields. I'm not going to go through the details of how CRFs work. Um, I'll mention that um, in an AMIA competition for de-identification back in 2007, CRFs were basically shown to be the most efficacious way of finding identifiers. So we, we're continuing to move in that direction. 
So um, in 2010, we published a paper uh, about a software engine that we created called the MITRE Identification Discover Toolkit that, that we developed in collaboration with um, Lynette Hirschman's group at, at the MITRE Corporation. Um, so if, if, uh, I'm going to show you a lot of things about MIST in a moment, um, but I did want to mention that there is a competing piece of open source software to MIST called HIDE that was developed by Lee Shong at, at Emory University. Um, HIDE is the Health Information De-Identification Toolkit. Okay, so, um, so here's an example of MIST. So basically what you get with MIST is you see that it, it segments your text document and it gives you a GUI for determining or specifying whether or not something is an identifier and if it is an identifier, what type of a HIPAA identifier are we talking about? Are you talking about uh, a date or an age? Are you talking about the uh, institution name? Are you talking about a particular address or a phone number? And so this is basically the tagging. This is annotation. Um, there's actually a whole bunch of things that are now going to go on under the hood after you've tagged the document. Um, so it's going to do some tokenization, some part of speech tagging, it's going to do some vector creation, and then what it's going to do is it's going to learn a grammar around each of your identifier types. Okay? And so that grammar is then going to be used to predict when you see identifiers in future documents. Okay, so does MIST work? So here's an example of data from Vanderbilt's electronic medical record system, and we didn't use any dictionaries. All we did was build grammars and check to see if we could find the identifiers. So we took four different types of notes. We took discharge reports, uh, discharge summaries, laboratory reports, uh, letters, which are basically clinical communications, and we took um, data from the CPOE. We took orders. Um, and, and you can see that we used more in the laboratory and orders uh, just because those were shorter documents. So we, we wanted to have more samples in order to, to beef up the training capability. Okay, so we've got um, testing uh, corpora that are about one quarter the size of our training corpora, and you can see that we've got precision on the order of around 0.9 to about 0.95, um, 0.9, 0 0.95. See, you guys have to catch me on this. See, that's, that's a lie. All right, the recall, on the other hand, you're looking at around 0.95 or 0.99. So remember, DID, which was a lot of rules, a really significant number of rules that were highly specialized to Vanderbilt, was about 0.99. And we're getting into that range without using any dictionaries, uh, just by using training of around 200 to 400 documents that people have sat down and annotated. Now, that takes time, but it's only a one-time event. So we're feeling pretty comfortable about using something like MIST. Um, there was then a study done by uh, Imre Selfie's group at uh, uh, Cincinnati Children's that looked at a wide variety of note types. And the question that he asked was, how does the use of CRFs influence your ability to retain meds? He basically just wanted to see for this one specific type of clinical information, clinical data, it did, it, did it ruin your ability to find this information? And basically what he showed was that on the original notes, they took a medication extraction method and they found that they had precision of around 96.3, recall of around 89, and that on the scrub notes, or the identified notes, they had a recall basically in the same range. Sometimes it was a little better. Uh, and they had precision that was also right in the same range. Um, balanced F measure, which is basically just the harmonic mean of those two, also, right in the same range. In other words, they said, didn't have any influence on our ability to reuse those clinical notes for research purposes, at least if you're doing med extraction. Okay, great. So, we have not ripped out DID just yet and started running with MIST. Now, there's still a couple things we're trying to work out before we get to that point. One of the things is that, um, you know, it's not quite to the same high fidelity that, that DID is at yet. One of the concerns is leaked PHI. So leaked PHI is basically just something you failed to redact, right? So in this situation, the daughter's name was failed to, re failed to redact. Lynn, we also have uh, a date, 510, uh, and, and this doctor's name was still in there. Okay, so there also is, is 
this little aspect, I call it the little, this, this little problem of you'd never really know what's going to be in text, right? You know, it can say that, you know, the girl set her brother's hair on fire at two, or she pushed him down the steps at five, she went to the Olympics when she was seven, and none of that is really designated as an identifier under HIPAA. And none of the, the, the CRF stuff that we're developing is going to find those types of things. So really, that's an issue that we're going to hold off to the side, and you can come back to it at a later point in time. Really, when we talk about leaked PHI, we're talking about specific identifiers. So, right, so this is one of the reasons why we say data use agreements are a necessity with this type of information. Okay, so recently what we've been working with is what we call um, hiding in plain sight, which is you leave all of the stuff that you failed to redact in place. It's just too difficult to find sometimes. You may never get to that point. You may keep building the better mousetrap and you're just gonna get stuck, right? And so you can invest lots of money to try and push your software from being 95% accurate to like 98 and, and it just may not be worth the time and effort. Instead, it might be better to just try and reconstitute fake information to the document. Um, I'm not necessarily an advocate for falsifying information, but we're not using the identifiers for clinical research here. We're only using it to hide what we may have failed to actually redact. Um, so this is a, a study that, that David Carroll and I uh, at, at the Group Health Cooperative of Puget Sound started, uh, and, and we just published a paper on this uh, about a month ago. Basically, we, we did HIPS with MIST, um, we did a study on about 130 oncology notes from group health, and we had to force MIST, first of all, into a dumbed-down state to find enough PHI to do the study on. So we basically undertrained it. Um, and what we did was we reconstituted it with fake information, and then we gave the documents to humans. Um, one was a chart abstractor, and in this, in this other case it was a chart abstractor. And we said, tell us. Which of these pieces of information are real and which are fake? So we're now doing basically a behavioral experiment. So this one was, this one was IRBs's. And so, um, all right, so we had 35 patient names. Six of them we failed to redact. So what this means is that you would have had a precision of 17% on average. Uh, that's what you would expect to see if you uh, had somebody who is just guessing, right, at random. Uh, and then dates, we originally had 180 and there were 17 that we failed to redact, so about 9% rate on that. All right, so we went to the first person. We said, what do you feel comfortable predicting? They didn't feel comfortable predicting on names, even when we said, look, predict. They were like, no, I don't feel comfortable about this. Um, and the dates, they said, all right, I feel comfortable on the dates. And they predicted one. Uh, you can also see with the ages, in this case, they predicted five. And they got nothing. They got them all incorrect. Um, so they're doing worse than what we would expect to see if somebody was just randomly guessing because they were just unsure about what they were doing. Um, now you can see there were some other situations where like in the practice names, so the practitioner names, uh, they, they were actually pretty good at, at finding when we failed to redact a practitioner name because they knew the names of some of the practitioners. Um, the second abstractor, this person, was actually a lot better. Um, so they made 12 predictions on the name, and four times they were actually correct, which was a uh, precision of about you know, 33%, or is 33%, which was better than what we would have seen at random. Okay, similar types of events um, were seen as well, but I will notice that, note that on date, they made 35 predictions, only one of them were correct, which is again, way lower than random. Um, so, here's the thing. Even though that second person was capable of finding some of the names, that's actually better than what would have happened in a de-identification situation in which you hadn't used something like hiding in plain sight. So the conclusion that we had from this, and this was a very small study, and we just got a grant to start building this out on a larger scale, is that if you invoke this type of a strategy, you're actually going to take the effective de-identification performance, which is about 0.95, and you automatically push it up to 0.99 because the predictions end up being, well, yeah, they got a couple right, but it's actually worse still than what it would have been if you hadn't done it at all. Okay, so 
Let's come back to, let me just refresh you. Um, we're talking about de-identified data. Basically, at this point, I've now described to you what we do at Vanderbilt. So I wanted to take a couple of minutes to show you where this goes when you start moving beyond Vanderbilt and you start playing around with different de-identification models. And so moving away from Safe Harbor, I wanted to, to delve a little into the expert determination standard. So under expert determination, does anybody have any questions yet? I've been talking for a while. No? Okay, so expert determination says the following. Um, go find someone who uses accepted statistical and scientific principles and they're gonna certify for you that the risk is small, that somebody who received the data could use reasonably available information to identify the, ind the individual. Okay, so what does this mean? Now, to really get a handle on this, first of all, let me take a step back. Um, experts, this is a really, really weird thing. Um, if I was to say to you, go find an expert in de-identification, how easy would it be to do so? How many people think that you could you know, walk to somebody at, let's, let's say at UPenn or CHOP, and just say, can you certify the de-identification of my data? Could anybody do that? Right, so this is really true in that there's probably only about six people in this country that end up giving these types of certifications. And some of them have formed really, really big money-making companies in order to do this. Um, they're my friends, I'm saying this, I know I'm going on TV afterwards, but they do well. All right, so we've been trying to develop technologies that can be free and open source and made readily available that other people can use so that they can get more flexibility in their de-identification. And the first thing you have to recognize is that de-identification is more than a matter of uniqueness. Um, let me give you an example. If you want to start playing around with dates, if you want to retain dates, you want to have an idea of the population that you're pulling information from. So let's go back to the study that we were looking at earlier about this date of birth, gender, zip code issue. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and get a model for the U.S. population. Now, to get a model, we're going to use U.S. Census data. The problem with U.S. Census data is that it only gives us aggregated information. So it says, this is how many people were born in this year or had a particular age, and these are the zip codes in which they live. Now, if you want to try and disaggregate that into birth dates, a bunch of different ways you can do it. The way that we've been working with is a, is a strategy for just balls and bins. So you're just basically throwing balls into bins at random. So this randomized model uh, it seems to work pretty well. We've seen, we've seen in practice in studies. So, all right, so Phil Gall uh, did a study, basically showed that 63% of the US was unique on this model. Um, this is a little different than what Latanya Sweeney had published at that time, but we work with Phil's model because it's a bit more probabilistic. Um, uh, okay, we're out of time. I'm not going to go through all of the details of the math. But, so here's a case study in the state of Tennessee. All right, These are, this is basically everybody that lives in our state. And what we looked at was what are the group sizes for people under various policies. So we were comparing the limited data set, which basically says this is what you get to a trusted individual, and Safe Harbor, which is basically, this is what you give to somebody who you don't trust, and you're just gonna give them the data, and they're no longer covered by HIPAA. All right, blue line limited data set, basically what you see is that it starts, everybody's about unique. 33% uh, of the state is unique on the combination of ethnicity, gender, date of birth, and county in which they live. All right, um, by the time you get to a group size of about 33, everybody's covered. Now when we looked at Safe Harbor, what we found was about 0.04% of the state was unique, or was expected to be unique, on ethnicity, gender, year of birth, and at this point we're just using the state. We call this safe harbor light because that's what people tend to disclose. And we saw that as we increased that threshold, increased that group size, we took it out to the magic number of 20,000. That was the one associated with zip codes, said you can't give out a geocode if it corresponds to 20,000 or less. And what we found was about, well, 20,000, you're leaving about 30% of the state at risk at that point, all right? So, I should mention, this is, this is cumulative distribution function, not, not a PDF. 
Okay, so we did this study for all U.S. states, and basically what you see is that it, it's relatively the same across the states, though it's but it's there's a little bit of variability. Um, so this is this is unique, still really small on the order of like 0.02 to 0.04 percent. Um, by the time you get out to 10, um, you're looking at still around 0.25 percent of a state is going to be um, not on a worst case scenario identifiable. Uh, and then in a limited data set, it's, you know, by the time you get to 10, it's about 95% of the state. So Tennessee was a, it was a, a rare beast in that regard. Okay, so the other thing when you're constructing an expert model is that you have to have a clear definition of risk. The problem is that there's a lot of definitions of risk. And it's a question of which one do you want to use. So what's that Venn diagram on the right? Imagine those little green circles are the people who come to their hospital with a particular demographic combination. So let's say like F1 is like, that's five-year-old Asian boys, okay? The big F, that is all of the five-year-old Asian boys that live in the region, okay? And then, and then you can see that you could define this relationship for every possible demographic combination. So there's three types of risks. One of which is called the prosecutor risk. The prosecutor risk says they know they're in your data set, right? They know they're in that green group. So the risk of your data set is basically that individual. It's one over that smallest group size. Um, the journalist risks, which is basically the AOL case, they don't know they're in your data set. They think they might be in your data set. So the risk is that it's the group that has that's outside your hospital that has the smallest size. So that smallest red ball. Now the marketer risk is what we tend to play around with because we say we don't know where an adversary is going to attack. So we take the average risk. We look at the risk of how many people would be identified if your adversary tried to re-identify everyone. And the risk is basically proportional to how many people you would be confused with. Okay, are you in a group of two, a group of three, what have you. Okay, so we started looking at what we call a trust differential. In other words, we wanted to know how much more trustworthy somebody was in, as a scientific investigator with a limited data set as opposed to a marketer, uh, as a safe harbor data set, the public. And basically what we saw, and this is important, was that these expert models have to be tuned to the data sets. They have to be specialized to the place in which the data is being disclosed because the risk changed depending on where you were. State of Delaware, that risk increased by about a factor of 1,000. State of Illinois, it increased by a factor of 65,000. That's an artifact of small data, like the small data samples. So when we took this out to the magic number of 20,000, we saw Delaware's risk doesn't change, which was weird, because we asked people in DC, well, what's the point of having a limited data set at this point? And they said, let's not talk about that. <laughs> and, and so um, in Illinois, you see it, it goes from 65,000 uh, down to 37. We're, that's a bit more realistic. Okay, so this gets me to the central dogma of re-identification. I've been talking to you a lot about de-identification. It's one side of the story to say that data is unique and it's distinguishable or it has uh, certain characteristics. Really what happens is on one side of the volume you've got de-identified data and then you also have to figure out how to identify it. Right? So we've seen some examples of this, but in, in essence, really what we've seen are people who had a linking mechanism. And this doesn't always exist. So when, when what I was just showing you was really a worst case scenario, you know, let's go back to what, what Sweeney did. Basically, you have to exploit these demographics, and how do you do that? So there are a lot of publicly available registries, like birth records, death registers, marriage records, there are professional records, like um, lists of physicians or lawyers. Basically, what's in vogue are voter registration databases. If you look at any paper on privacy and health-related data, they all say you should be afraid that Sweeney's gonna come back and re-identify you through a voter registration list. Um, and so they say, look, so, so let's, or I've said, so, so let's take a look at what happens when you actually link something to a voter registration list. So what fields are we gonna be getting? Who has access to this data? More importantly, what is the cost associated with doing so? So um, I, I work for this, this group called the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network, which is an NIH consortia that, that CHOP's actually a member of. And when, when we started with, with eMERGE, we started looking at different ways of de-identifying the data. So we, 
we looked at the different state policies for sharing this public information. You can see that in Illinois, where we're working with Northwestern, it's 500 bucks. You get access to all the, the little naughty bits that you're interested in, except for the race of the individual, right, which we're going to try and use to identify someone. Um, in, in Wisconsin, on the other hand, where the Marshfield Clinic is, it costs $12,500 to get access to this data, and all I get is your name and your address. That's it. I don't, I don't get your age. I don't get your, your gender. I don't get your ethnicity. All right, so there's variability here. Um, so what happened? Identifiability goes down according to our, our models. Um, on average, it was going down by just a factor of three. I'm showing you this with respect to limited data sets because the, the safe harbor were already low risk to begin with. Um, and so you can see that for some states, it changes, like Illinois. For other states, like my state, it doesn't change because we give out all the little naughty bits that people are interested in using for identification purposes. This takes me to the cost. So, so this is interesting. So if I'm somebody who wants to do an attack and exploit the healthcare industry and say, you guys shouldn't share de-identified data, the states that we should be looking at in terms of protection that require the most protection are places like Virginia and South Carolina because they don't charge for access to this type of data. Um, and so in South Carolina, it's expected that if they tried to do a re-identification on data from the state, you'd get around 1,300 people. Um, wouldn't cost anything. Places I don't worry about, they don't make me lose sleep, are Wisconsin and West Virginia, because look at the safe harbor data set. You know, you got two identifications in Wisconsin, and it cost me almost $7,000 to do them all. And that's if you try to identify everybody in the state. Okay, so there was a real study that was published last year, about a year and a half ago. Um, this was a challenge that was posted by the ONC. They actually got a group of um, investigators at the University of Chicago, headed up by the former president of the American Statistical Association. They said, here's 15,000 safe harbored records <laughs> from a uh, self-identified minority ethnicity. It was basically blacks in North Carolina. They revealed this afterwards. And they said, tell us who these people are. They spent a lot of money. They got a lot of data from various public record systems and commercial brokers. And they correctly got two people identified. Here's the funny thing. They couldn't tell you which of the two people they actually identified. Because what happened was they made guesses on all 15,000 people. And they said, hey, ONC, were we right? And they're like, yeah, twice out of 15,000, which is actually a lower expected rate of re-identification than in most of these systems. If you want to read the story, uh, Deborah Lasky, who was at the ONC, put out this presentation on it. Um, where are we? OK. So we also did a systematic review. We looked at all re-identification attempts that were committed through October 2010. Um, we looked at re-identifications on any type of data. What we found was that 11 of 14 were conducted by people who were doing demo attacks, like me. Two of the 14 were against attacks that were following any type of a standard. This is important because a lot of them were like AOL, where there was no standard and the individual put their name in the data, which is not de-identified. Of the cases that actually were subject to a HIP health standard, health standard like Safe Harbor, health de-identification standard, the success rate of those published studies was extremely low. So we basically concluded based on that systematic review, it was a long story, that, that we don't have evidence for claiming that the sky has fallen. So when we went to go build alternative de-identification models, here's what we did. So now that we know how to measure risk. We took the patient cohort, we subjected it to safe harbor. We get our little safe harbor cohort. And then what we do is we estimate our risk based using something like the census. And then we'll apply a risk mitigation procedure. And we'll say when the risk of this result is no worse than what you had in your safe harbor data set, then we're going to say that's OK to go. Um, a little bit of the algorithmics behind this real quick. Basically what we found was that you could take all policies and put them on a lattice. So here, here's an example of this lattice. It's a lattice that basically corresponds to, each of these values corresponds to a value in the file, in your data. So zero, like here's an example. So when your policy is all the way down here, it's in its most specific form, you get all your genders, all your ages, and anything else you're gonna be interested in sharing. When it's somewhere in the middle, some of these ages end up getting a bit generalized. When it's all the way up at the top, everything in its most generalized form. Now, 
The wonderful thing about this is that risk with respect to populations is monotonic on this lattice. So basically, I can say, well, this is where safe harbor is. I'm going to measure risk. And then I'm going to go start searching for alternatives. Now, I'm not going to search the entire thing, because this thing can be on the order of billions of nodes in size. So what we do is we take a seed, and we basically start systematically searching. We say, if the risk of this one was better than safe harbor, then I can be a little bit more specific. So I search down. And if that doesn't work out for me, I can jump back up. I know that there may be something in this region along this path that might be OK. And we basically have a search strategy that's like that. Um, we did this. We, we then showed how this could be applied with various data sets in the eMERGE network. Because um, these are data sets that we're going to be sharing to dbGaP. And here's one from Vanderbilt. Basically, we have a cohort of about 3,000 people in an ECG study. And, and we had 12 people who were over the age of 89, which according to HIPAA says you can't sell, share that under Safe Harbor. And what we showed was that there were a bunch of different alternative methods that would allow you to share that, because the risk was smaller than Safe Harbor itself. So this one is not very desirable. Get rid of gender. But you could also just group the 52 and the 53-year-olds, because that just happens to be a strange aspect of our, our population. You could have also said, I'm not going to tell you when somebody's Asian, I'm just going to group that into the other, which for the most part, these are really difficult people to resolve in a genomic study to begin with. All right, um, so when we did this with all the eMERGE data sets, these are all of the cohorts. Everybody's studying different phenotypes. The one that I want to draw your attention to are these two. This is dementia from Group Health. They've got a lot of elderly individuals. Um, and we also have a cataract study that Mar Marshfield is doing, and 10% of their population was above that, uh, that age at which you can't share data. Um, when we started looking at alternative policies, what we found, first of all, the nice thing was that we could do things like just generalize the ethnicity to black, white, and other, give you every single age, and Marshfield was good to go, as was everybody else. Um, it didn't work so well for group health. For group health, we basically had to take the age up to 10-year bins. Now, this was actually still desirable beyond what they currently had because they had a lot of people that were over 100. And so there was actually considered to be a major difference in their Cox regressions between what went on at 90 and what went on at 100. So we were actually to boost a little bit of information into that data set. Um, all right, um, I won't go through this part. Um, basically, what I've shown you with respect to privacy and de-identification from the technical perspective as we move beyond what the standard models are is you can do relational data. The question is, what are you worried about is really what we're trying to get at. So we've seen that demographics tend to be the most exploited thing if people try to do anything. But there also there are some concerns about diagnoses. There are some concerns about lab values, as I mentioned earlier, and there's also text. And you can develop strategies for protecting all of these, but you have to be careful that you don't take it too far. You want to invoke the things that you think are going to give you the best bang for your buck. At the present time, we do not have a guidebook that tells you which things you're supposed to actually protect. What we're doing is we're developing the methods, and we're going to let people make determinations over what they think they need to invoke. Um, I think I'm, I'm out of, just about out of time. I'm way over, aren't I? Wow. I'm really sorry. Uh, We're all you, still here. Yeah, no kidding. You're supposed to stop me. Um, do, I, do, I, do, you want, do you want one more thing? Give you an example of how these things work with, with diagnosis codes. Um, what are you looking at here? So how many people are familiar with QQ plots? All right. So, so basically, this is a genome-wide association study. This is the result of what happens when we anonymize clinical codes to ensure that every single individual has the same clinical codes as four other people. Okay? You're in a group size of five. So your demographics are protected, and now what we're saying is we want to make sure that your clinical codes don't identify you. Right? Um, the most important thing about what you're looking at is right there on the right-hand side. When you've got a lot of people, what we did was we took all the Vanderbilt patients from a particular study, 5,000 patients, and we said, what happens when we anonymize you in the context of about one and a half million patients? If your adversary doesn't know you were in that specific study, 
but they know that you were at the hospital, what happens? And so what you see on that, that bottom, that x-axis, this is the, uh, the p-value of the resulting association for various clinical codes and a particular SNP. And what you see on the y-axis is this is the resulting p-value that you end up getting from the anonymized database. Okay, the correlation in that QQ plot is about 0.995. In other words, we can have a formal anonymization strategy on demographics and clinical data, and you actually don't sacrifice any of your ability to do phenome-wide association studies. We have similar results of this for just about every SNP we've actually studied. Um, so we're, we're publishing this next month. So I, I go through the rest of this, but I'm way over time. Definitely, definitely not going to talk about identifiability of DNA today. Uh, so, my final thoughts. De-identification, it's a speed bump. I mentioned that before. It's basically just a hurdle that you're throwing in somebody's well way. If somebody wants to identify the data, they are going to find a way to identify the data. And chances are, they're not going to use the identified data. They're just going to pay off somebody who was associated with managing the data to begin with. We can construct more solutions, more secure solutions. Um, so, we do a lot of work with cryptography, and, and I think it's a beautiful solution. But at the same time, you have to be practical. So a lot of people want data in their hands, and they want to touch it, they want to manipulate it. So we have to be careful there. I just mentioned to you that risk is unavoidable. Really what we're trying to do is ensure that the risk is manageable and quantifiable. If there's anything that I've learned from working with the federal government and working with Vanderbilt over time is that any de-identification policy, any health policy that relies on technology is going to be take and give. Um, there's a lot of people who publish the identification strategies that are really not cognizant of what the policies actually say. They say, here's a way in which you should share the data. And they're not actually, they don't dock well with what the federal regulation says. So they may be these beautiful methods, but they're not actually acceptable under current standards. So, so they're really ships passing in the night. All right, so um, there's a lot of people that I work with. Dan Mason being one of them. You'll hear from him later. The eMERGE teams, it's a really large network. Um, it's getting bigger. So you'll, you can expect to see more things from us in the future. Uh, and, and I'll stop because I clearly have taken up your Monday afternoon. And, and if you have questions, I don't know if you want to ask them now. <laughs>